Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. And my home organization is the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. Um, we have done a lot of webinars thanks to COVID. It's it created a whole new realm for all of us, both as participants and as, as producers of content, I guess is what we've become. Um, we are, first I should thank Bob Levering for having initiated this uh, whole project, this particular, the project of this program. Um, and uh, we have had it publicized for a couple, few weeks. Um, aren't as many people on as we had hoped, but I think this, as a result, we get more of a participatory program by going into a, a Zoom program rather than, than the webinar. So thank you everybody for, for being with us. Um, you see uh, our created um, logo, uh, obviously Dr. Spock and Dr. King were not, uh, carriers of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee banners, but um, we thought, I've always felt this was a great picture. This is uh, before the New York March um, and right after uh, Dr. King gave his April 4th uh, Beyond Vietnam talk, which if you've never listened to, you should go to our website and listen to it. Um, so, what we're going to do today is talk about a problem that the, or a question, an issue, a challenge that the country as a whole should be talking about, but isn't. Um, we're on the verge of changing the character of selective service um, by including women for the first time. Uh, you'll get some update on that from Ed Hasbrook. Um, and we will, uh, there is, well, I'm not gonna go into what he will say because it'll he'll say it much better. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna introduce people just before they speak. Um, so you'll remember what I, I've said and who it is you're watching. Um, we're gonna start out with Kara Vuick, who is at, Texas Christian University. Um, she's the author of The Girls Next Door, Bringing the Home Front to the Front Lines. Uh, and she is going to give us some background about the whole history of, of women in the military and selective service. Kara. All right, I have to remember to unmute myself. Yeah, stop the share. Are we good? Yeah, you're good. Okay, I was hearing a lot of background. So I just wanted to make, make sure it wasn't me. Um, so hi, everybody, thanks for coming. Um, again, thank you, John, for putting this together um, and for inviting me. I'm a historian, um, and so that, that's what I wanna talk about today is a little bit of history. Um, and in particular, um, to focus the history on women in selective service and the debates that the United States has had about these issues, um, because I keep seeing the same kinds of issues coming up. Um, in particular, two issues to keep in mind um, that I think inform the current, current issues and current um, legal changes um, are a history of how military service and citizenship have become so tightly bound in American history um, and how debates about women, military service and conscription um, always involve understandings of gender. Right, whether one thinks that women's and men's roles in society are socially and culturally constructed, therefore they change depending on your time, your location, um, all of that, or whether um, one thinks these are biologically um, or even divinely ordained. These are kind of the frameworks for a lot of these discussions. Um, and so from the beginning, and I'm trying to fit a lot of history in here, I, this is really challenging for a professor. Um, we normally have 50 minutes <laughs> minimum, so uh, I apologize, but I can come back to anything um, that I leave out or um, confuse in my rush here. 
Um, but from the beginnings of the nation's history, um, Americans have always had a very conflicted relationship with compulsory military service, right? They've had a, uh, you know, a nation founded um, in part as an opposition to standing armies has been a bit conflicted about compulsory service, um, to put it mildly. Um, and so that is going to play out um, in terms of women's history here. And it gets very complicated because increasingly um, various groups of people serve in the military as a way to gain the vote um, in the Civil War to gain emancipation, if not full citizenship. Um, a lot of immigrants have served to be to sort of get on the fast track to citizenship. Um, and with women having never been conscripted for service, never even compelled to register for selective service, um, that's a that's a strange place for women to be in, in this broader history of military service or translating to citizenship. Um, compound that with the fact that women's rights and roles have expanded most dramatically in American history during wartime. And so women have found themselves in a pretty um, sticky situation. Um, you see it most dramatically, I think, in World War I, right? The 19th Amendment that grants woman suffrage passes because of women's military service. Um, that is much to the chagrin of a whole lot of women, right, who thought that they should be able to vote as citizens and human beings, um, but that was not the justification um, given in Congress or by President Wilson. The justification was women served, ergo they vote. Um, and so that left a very convoluted um, and complicated legacy um, when thinking about women and, and their military service. Um, the question then again, obviously comes up in World War II, um, which raises questions about equal obligations, wartime needs, ideas of gender, and kind of how to balance these three sometimes competing notions. Um, President Roosevelt actually recommended in 1940 that both women and men per uh, perform national service. That didn't pass, um, but as the war dragged on, the public, generally speaking, became more accepting of the idea of conscripting women for some sort of service. Um, Representative Seller of New York had introduced legislation to draft single unemployed women for home front duties. He thought it was very in inefficient to draft men, train them for work on the home front, then send them to war and have to hire women um, or train women to fill their shoes. He thought you should just train women for home front duties and send men directly to war. Um, that never passed, but that was one of the steps along the way of sort of an expanded um, public embrace of that idea. Um, Gallup polls showed that the public preferred drafting single women over fathers. Um, for example, there was a lot of debate about the expansion of conscription in World War II to fathers, um, which was a lot of a big debate. Um, and most of the public preferred drafting single women um, instead of fathers for a while. Um, the issue most dramatically comes up when Congress um, very nearly approved the drafting of nurses. Um, this is late 44, early 45. The Allies were moving through France and Germany um, and the army was about 10,000 nurses short. Um, in many ways, that's a self-imposed shortage because they wouldn't accept men who were nurses and they wouldn't accept um, very many black women who were nurses. And so they created this shortage themselves. Um, but Congress, um, the House representatives in a bipartisan move approved the conscripting of nurses. FDR had proposed the idea, um, was going to sign it. And by, uh, by early 1945, stalled in the Senate, women started enlisting, the war ends, um, and it was all moot at that point. Um, and so a lot of the rationale for drafting or registering women in some way, even theoretically, is it, through a language of um, military need, right? That this would serve the nation. This is um, sort of couched in martial needs. The opposition to women's military service writ large um, and also possible conscription was largely based in conventional gender. You hear a lot of opposition you know, men saying we can't have women in the military because what will become of the nation, right? Who's going to tend the home fires kind of language, um, which is always fun for students to read. They can't believe people spoke like that, but they did. Um, and so a lot of that was, again, couched in traditional kind of gender, gendered language. Um, if we skip ahead to the 70s, 
There's a lot of fun stuff we're skipping, but we're skipping it anyway. Um, you get to how this all gets wrapped up in debates about the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and when Congress debated the ERA in the early 70s, there was a lot of very frank discussion that the ERA would mean that women would have to serve uh, or would have to be registered for selective service. Um, proponents of the ERA argued that equal rights incurred equal obligation. Um, that was the report of the Senate Judiciary Committee. That was the stance of equal rights feminists, um, groups like NOW, um, the Women's Equity and Action League, the ACLU, all said that if there is a selective service that women need to be included. Um, a lot of these groups, um, sort of given the, the time frame um, and their involvement in anti-Vietnam War protests, opposed conscription writ large, but they all said if registration, if conscription occurs, women need to be included on an equal basis. Um, the, op the opponents tried to defeat the ERA by pointing out that women would have to register and all of those attempts um, were defeated. And so when Congress sent the ERA to the states for ratification in 72, they knew that it would require um, conscripted military service in the event that happened, right? By the late 70s, things had, had shifted very, very dramatically and very quickly um, with the rise of social and cultural um, conservatism. Um, and you see groups like Phyllis Shafley Stop ERA, um, other groups as well, rallied opposition to the ERA largely through a language that the ERA would draft mothers. Um, they're very good at the language, you know, that we're going to drag mothers away from babies. Um, lots of language about women's nature, um, you know, creating life. Um, they use the word daughters a lot as opposed to women. Um, and a lot of that language, of course, should be familiar to people who are following um, all of this. A lot of these tactics um, continue today. So the opposition to that which is very successful by the late 70s, even in the early 80s, after Carter proposes registering women, it's the same kind of opposition, that you can't draft our daughters, that you're gonna drag mothers away from, from cradles. Um, it's sort of back to a gendered language. Um, now, all of this becomes legal um, precedent when the Supreme Court takes up Ross v. Goldberg, um, which as everyone here knows, I'm quite sure, um, even though there was not a quiz at the beginning, I'm quite sure everybody knows what Ross Kirby Goldberg is. Um, but interestingly, in, in talking about women, had begun as an anti-Vietnam War um, sort of case, like all kinds of arguments against conscription. And by the time it got to the Supreme Court, had been whittled down only to sex discrimination. And that was the issue that the court took up. Um, and so the court ruled, um, because women are excluded from combat and because Con because conscription serves to conscript bodies for combat, women can be excluded. That was the essence of the decision. Um, it was faulty in part because it conflated registration and conscription, which is something I see a lot today, even in the language about the current bills, that they conflate registration and conscription. Um, and it was based on a faulty understanding of how conscription works, right? Conscription in the, in, since the Civil War has not, has not served primarily to draft for combat positions. Um, the military, because we fight on other people's lands, has a humongous tooth to tell ratio, which Larry can tell you more about, I'm sure. Um, but that means that most conscripts serve in support positions. Um, and so the very rationale of the Rosker decision um, was a bit faulty, but that's the logic that continues to frame a lot of the discussion um, today. Even Senator Lee's resolution opposing women's registration talks about the primary function for drafted men is to replace frontline combatants, um, which is just not the case. Um, and a lot of that opposition language is framed in this rhetoric that the military is not a social experiment, right? That women are somehow going to throw the whole thing up in the air um, and ruin morale and, and be a danger. It's the same language that has been used since World War II to justify excluding African Americans, excluding gay men and women, um, gets used today to ex um, in the rhetoric to exclude trans individuals. Um, and what I find historically interesting, and I'm, I'm will be done here in one minute, um, is that it, it still you the the question of conscripting women unites some strange political allies. 
Um, you have men's rights groups aligned with feminists um, and groups arguing for equal treatment before the law. You have pacifists and anti-militarists um, opposed to conscription on any grounds, united with cultural conservatives, <laughs> whose language about gender they probably find fairly objectionable. Um, and so it's this odd mix of sort of political allies on both sides. Um, but in US law, registration for selective service is the last legal distinction between the obligations of citizenship for men and women. And so whatever one thinks of the issue, um, I think we are on the eve of seeing um, a profound change in the legal, um, legal standing of women and men in this country. So I will end it there. I can expand on anything. That was, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, but you have to explain tooth to tail. <laughs> tooth to tail. So the Marines would call this the tip of the spear. Um, essentially, this means that the, the U.S. military has a very, very few um, people in combat positions. Far more people are doing, you know, the cooking, the cleaning, they're ordering the toilet paper, they're doing the logistics, they're doing all sorts of other kinds of support work. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> One learns all kinds of things. <laughs> so uh, thank you, that really sets a nice context for this discussion. Um, I'm, the, I am of the generation, the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee is largely composed of people for whom the anti-war movement was a seminal part of our lives. And one of the seminalist parts of the seminal moment was if you were male, what you were gonna do about the draft. Uh, in my case, I got back from the Peace Corps in Peru. I was 24 and I was 1A and the history goes on from there. Um, the person, as who I said, inspired this discussion, Bob Levering, uh, as you'll see in his bio, and I posted the link for all of the bios on the chat, but Bob is, is the executive producer and advisor to a film called The Boys That Said No, and if he doesn't mention, we will be sending out a whole bunch of information about the official premiere of this film, and if you haven't seen it, you certainly should, because it captures a crucial moment and an engine for a lot of what happened afterwards in the anti-war movement. Bob. Okay. Uh, thanks, John. And uh, Can you speak up you... a little bit? You're... I'll try. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Thanks, John, and uh, thanks, Kara. That was very informative. Now I'm going to uh, uh, read my presentation because I wanted to keep to seven minutes. Um, so when people talk about how to stop or prevent forever wars, some of them propose bringing back the draft. To bolster this suggestion, they point to the experience of the Vietnam War. Without the draft, there would have been no anti-war movement, they'll say. So the draft ought to be restored to make sure that the impact of any war is shared by many more Americans than has been the case in our two decades long war on terror. That would make it more likely for there to be more opposition. So I wanna use my seven minutes to poke some holes in this argument. First, rather than looking at the impact of the draft on creating the anti-war movement, we should consider the impact of the draft on the war in Vietnam itself. In early 1964, shortly after LBJ became president, there were 23,000 US troops in Vietnam. A year later, there were 80, 184,000. By the next year, that had doubled to 385,000. And the following year, there were more than half a million. Now, how was the president able to ramp up those numbers so quickly? The draft, of course, all they needed to do to get more young bodies into the war was to up the monthly quotas of conscripted soldiers. Without the draft, LBJ and the war makers would have had a far more difficult time conducting a major land war in Asia. In short, far from putting the brakes on the war in Vietnam, the draft was the primary tool used to escalate the American involvement. After all, conscription is one of the weapons in the military's arsenal. It is part of the war machine. Second, from the standpoint of US history, it simply is not true that conscription has laid 
led to major anti-war movements that didn't happen in any other instance when the draft was used. The Civil War, or World War I, or World War II, or the Korean War. Part of the reason is that conscription is not only a weapon for prosecuting wars, but the government has used conscription laws to go after those who oppose the war. The government reacted especially harshly against opponents of World War I, some of whom were Quakers and other religious pacifists, but it also included many socialists who opposed the war on political grounds. Those who refused to cooperate with the draft were tried by military courts and conditions in military prisons were barbaric, including beatings and torture. At least 17 died in prison as a result of torture or poor prison conditions. And not only were those a draft age targeted, Eugene Debs, the socialist leader, was convicted of sedition for urging young men to resist the draft, and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. And those of us who were around during the Vietnam War recall that Dr. Benjamin Spock and four others, including Michael Ferber, who may be on our call today, were indicted for encouraging draft resistance. This could easily become relevant again. Others on this panel may talk about the various penalties that can be incurred today for violating the draft law, both legal and extrajudicial. Imagine how this weapon could be used in a time of wartime hysteria when folks try to outdo each other with displays of their patriotism. USA, USA, USA. We all experienced a version of this hysteria after 9-11 when only one member of Congress voted against giving the president a blank check that has been used ever since for the forever wars. Or think about this weapon being in the hands of a Trump-like president who could use it against his opponent. Finally, rather than seeing what happened during the Vietnam War as an argument for conscription, we should realize that the anti-Vietnam War movement was an anomaly. It is the only instance in US history and one of the very few in human history where a domestic anti-war movement during wartime became so powerful that it not only forced an end to conscription, but also was a major element if not the principal factor that ended the war itself. I'm not arguing for the existence of the draft. I'm not arguing that the existence of the draft did not contribute to the intensity of the anti-war movement. But I believe there are two other factors that were equally, if not more important, in explaining why Vietnam provoked such a powerful anti-war movement. Unlike other major conflicts, Vietnam had the weakest casus belli or justification for going to war of any major war in American history. To say the least, the Gulf of Tonkin incident that LBJ, LBJ used to get congressional approval for the war was not at all like the sinking of American ships before World War I, a Pearl Harbor for the Second World War, or 9-11 that precipitated the war on terror. The other factor was television. Vietnam was the first televised war. Those of us who were alive then certainly recall watching the nightly news with the recitations of body counts for the day and the horrific photos of soldiers torching peasant hunts, the naked child with napalm burns, the Tet Offensive when the Saigon police chief executed a prisoner on live TV. Previous wars occurred before television and press coverage was heavily censored. Since Vietnam, the Pentagon has made sure that embedded journal journalists of the subsequent wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and so on, simply don't have the kind of access to the war zones that they had in Vietnam. They've done their best to sanitize the blood and gore of America's so-called war on terror. And to a large extent, they've succeeded. To sum up, I disagree with those who use the Vietnam experience to argue for conscription, but I do think that what we accomplished during that war is relevant today simply because it shows that a powerful resistance movement can succeed. To stop the forever wars, we need to create a movement that focuses on dis <clears throat> dismantling the American war machine. Since one of the that machine's weapons is conscription, we need to create a movement that resists conscription in all its forms, certainly including the registration of women. Thank you, Bob. Uh, that's helped to set the challenge before us. There 
uh, he didn't talk as much about the anti the role of the anti draft movement in the anti war movement. So you'll have to watch the film to to get that. Um, uh, the uh, next speaker is Edward Hasbrook. Uh, if there's a single person who has had as as his focus, his purpose, trying to challenge the post-Vietnam draft, it's Ed, and he is himself a resistor to the reinstituted registration process um, that he'll probably give you some history about that, that you didn't know. Um, but he's also, uh, if, for, if nothing else happens out of this webinar, I or this Zoom, I hope you, everybody gets on his mailing list to follow the, and track what is happening in Congress over the next several months and what happens after that. Ed. You're, on, you're muted still. Thank you, John, for that kind introduction. I, I do have more about the uh, post-Vietnam history of the draft on my website, resistors.info. Let me try to sum up. Um, there was a brief, but um, in retrospect, extremely significant hiatus following the end of the US war uh, in Indochina, after which uh, requirement for young men to register for potential military draft resumed in 1980. Um, it was explicitly styled as part of preparations for expanded US intervention uh, in what was then a proxy war and would only 20 years later become a boots on the ground war in Afghanistan. But in the first half of that 40 years of war in Afghanistan, which corresponds to uh, the, the current, you know, the history of the current phase of selective service, the US was supporting the people who would become the Taliban and Al Qaeda, and it should not be forgotten that the US government put people like me in prison for refusing to agree to fight on the side of the people who became the Taliban and Al Qaeda. And there's nothing in my life of which I will ever be more proud. But um, the registration started up in 1980 without much thought by the government to how it would work or be enforced. There was an assumption that people were still in the in an era in which people had grown up as my generation did not in that brief hiatus, taking for granted that we'd have to be subject to a draft. The response by people of my generation was far more oppositional than it had ever been at the peak of the Vietnam War, something most older people have not noticed. Um, and compliance with the initial demand uh, to register with the draft was far lower than the government had anticipated. Um, in sort of desperation, the government turned to uh, attempting to scare people into registering by making examples out of a few of the those they defined as or considered the most vocal non-registrants, including myself. But um, after the first 20 show trials, despite convictions and prison sentences in most cases, they found that those show trials were only calling attention to the resistance and most importantly, calling attention to the fact that those uh, who had not made public statements that could be used against them to prove their knowledge of the requirement and their criminal intent uh, were in no danger of prosecution and compliance declined even further. And with the system in abject failure, um, prosecutions were abandoned and never resumed. What we've had since is more than 30 years, more than an entire generation of stalemate in which registration had failed, the draft was in fact impossible, but there was no face saving way for Congress to end the registration requirement without admitting failure in the face of popular direct action, which isn't an easy thing to do. So, um, and, and in which you know, military planners continued significantly to pretend that the draft was a fallback option, uh, even though unrealistically. But back in 1980, there had also been challenges to the requirement that men but not women uh, register for the draft. At that time, the Supreme Court, uh, as Kara alluded to, um, found that there was a rational relationship between wanting only men for combat and requiring only men to register for the draft. So in 2015, when all combat assignments were open to women, the handwriting was on the wall and it became clear that Congress would either have to face uh, the courts eventually overturning the current registration requirement for men, or they'd have to choose either to end it entirely or to try to double down on the failure of draft registration for men by trying to expand it to women. 
I won't go through um, the whole what's happened over the last five years as to how that debate has gone out, most of which has been completely detached from any of the real issues. Um, but um, the denouement is that uh, this month the House voted and the Senate is on track to vote next month, uh, as John alluded to at the top, to vote to expand the requirement for young women as well as young men to register with the Selective Service System within 30 days of their 18th birthday and to report within 10 days every change of address until they turn 26, which virtually nobody does um, with the consequence that were there to be an attempt at a draft based on the current database, most induction notices would be returned as undeliverable and it'd be impossible to prove that people got them so they couldn't be prosecuted and those who opted out would simply go scot-free. But um, given that fact, um, uh, you know, and the, the attempt to expand registration uh, to women will fail. We can see that, you know, where there's 40 years of clear history of the experience with men. Uh, none of the proposals from Congress, the National Commission, any of the proponents of the draft include any realistic enforcement plan or budget or indeed any enforcement plan or budget at all. Um, and uh, women have all the same reasons to resist that men do, as well as an additional range of anti-war feminist reasons, as, as Rivera will um, go into more detail about. But at the same time, it is unfortunately likely that uh, the government will, you know, as it has done with men, attempt to um, ignore the resistance, pretend that everybody's in compliance, even though they obviously aren't, um, unless and until there's a movement that successfully raises a chant that the emperor has no clothes. But in this context, why does it, why should we care? There isn't actually that much threat of a draft and it's been taken off the table by direct action by young people. Why should we care about devoting attention as, a, as an anti-war movement or as activists to, to the issue? But I think that that framing misses the point, both the purpose and the consequences of draft resistance. I didn't publicly declare my refusal to register for the draft um, because I wanted to keep myself from being drafted. If I wanted to do that, I could have just stayed home, ignored the system, nothing would have happened to me, I wouldn't have gone to prison. I resisted the draft as a way to wield the power of direct action, a power the government had handed me by admitting they needed my compliance in order to staff up the military, to wield that power of direct action not to prevent myself from being drafted, but to prevent the wars that a draft serves. And even in the absence of a draft, the perceived availability of a draft as a fallback option enable military planners to plan for larger, longer, less popular wars and not to have to consider in their war planning whether the wars they are planning would actually have popular support or people would be willing to fight them. Taking the draft off the table forces into military planning the real constraints of popular willingness to submit and is a real way, one of the most powerful ways that direct action can constrain war making. So the reason to support draft resistance is not to protect young people against being drafted, but as a, to be an ally to the young people who by preventing a draft are helping protect us all against war a victory which they have taken 95% of the way in preventing a draft. We just need to help them take the last 5% of the way in getting popular recognition that the draft is not an option and getting it removed from war planning. But I also want to address the question uh, Robert alluded to, which is whether, um, whether having a draft would help prevent war. Now, in the first place, those who think that having a draft would help prevent war are as naive and unrealistic as those who think that having a draft would serve the interests of wars, even if you want to fight wars, which I don't, um, or even if you wanted to serve the U.S. national interests, which I don't as a humanist and an internationalist, um, or even if you thought that war was a means of defense, which I don't as a pacifist. But even if you thought any of those things, it's completely naive and unrealistic because the draft is not a real policy option. Um, and you have to, to, to accept that, like it or not, young people have taken it off the table. But beyond that, the argument that, you know, having a draft would make everyone feel that they have a stake in war is flawed in that it wouldn't be the case that everybody is at risk of being drafted. It's only young people. And so what you're really arguing, if you make that argument, is in effect that we should kidnap young people hold them hostage, threaten to kill them, and try to ransom them to old people with that threat in order to induce old people to oppose the war. And once we see the real logic implicit in that argument, it is not only grossly ageist, but morally bankrupt, repugnant, and should be rejected out of hand. But 
I also want to deal with the, the, the question um, that was posed about universal national service, so-called. Um, and the biggest problem with that of many, um, even if it had an enforcement mechanism, which it doesn't either, it's not any more realistic, but even if it did, um, and you were willing to set up the kind of police state and spend the kind of money you'd need to round everybody up and force some international service, um, it's not universal. What's being proposed always is some kind of requirement imposed only on young people, which is, I mean, not everybody came into the anti-draft movement from the perspective of support for youth liberation, as I did. But even if you don't accept that, there's a pragmatic argument that we are not going to solve our problems. We don't, by telling young people what to do, we don't need more young people to do what we tell them to do. It's us old people who've created the fundamental problems of the world, a world menaced by global warming, a world menaced by nuclear weapons. We're not gonna solve the problems we've created by telling young people what to do. If there is a solution, if there's a future, it's going to lie in our willing, willingness as older people, as allies to youth, to let them find solutions we could neither imagine nor anticipate, and our being willing to follow their leadership into a future on which our salvation and our survival depends. And that's, it's in that spirit that I look forward to working as an ally to the next generation of draft resistors. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, before we go on to our last two speakers, I wanna say a couple of procedural things. Um, the chat is open now if you want to raise a question, send a message to uh, any of the speakers. Um, the, uh, when we get to the point of discussion, it will be wide open for communication by everyone to everyone. And also, as you probably know, if there's somebody that you wanna, that you haven't seen in 40 years and you wanna send a message to. Um, this program is being recorded. It will be available in a, as soon as I can do the minimal editing on it to take off the stuff garbage at the beginning while we're getting ready. Um, and then it, we will expand our audience over the next months, if not years uh, on this issue, since it will be with us in one form or another uh, for some time. Um, I'd also, just want to say, if when we get to the point of discussion, uh, if you look in reactions at the bottom of your screen, click on reactions, you'll see raise hand. Um, if you want to be me to unmute you, then raise your hand, and we'll try and move the questioning and and comments around the the audience or the participants. It's this, this is a participant event now, not an audience event. Um, so we will go on to our next speaker, um, which again, Ed has set the context for, um, and that's Rivera's son, who is active with Code Pink and has written books and novels, uh, and is involved with the world, with that world beyond war and campaign nonviolence. So again, all everybody's biography in more detail than I've said verbally is, is available on the original, the homepage. So Rivera, it's yours. Great, thank you so much, John. And thank you to the previous speakers for setting, especially a historical context for the con the conversation we're having today. My job is, is not to talk about history, but to talk about the present and, um, to really speak to the anti-war feminist angle on this issue. Uh, as John said, I'm a member of Code Pink. I'm gonna do a total disclosure. I am 39 years old. I am not a draft age youth. I am not a uh, anti-war elder, <laughs> let's put uh, anti-Vietnam War elder. Uh, my father was a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War. There's a chance that I'm here today because he refused to go. Uh, he was also an organizer who actively helped people not 
be drafted, in some cases, even helping them to flee the country. This is the context to which I, as a very privileged young, young person, did not have to register for the draft. Um, and something that informs why I see myself as an anti-war feminist who opposes the draft, not just for women, but for people of all genders. And one of the things that is swirling around this issue is the question of how feminism is defined. If you talk to the pro-draft uh, women or men, some of them uh, really do see drafting women as an advancement towards gender equality. I take the stance, and many of my anti-war feminist colleagues take the stance, that you cannot find uh, equality within expanding injustice. So it is not feminist to draft women just because men are being drafted. It is feminist to abolish the draft for all genders because military conscription itself is not a duty as is being argued by the federal government. It is an injustice inflicted upon the citizens that carries the weight of moral injury, that carries the weight of ethical injury, that uh, conscripts the bodies of the citizenry, particularly the young bodies, to fight the wars that are determined within a system in which they have very little voice and representation in an effective and meaningful way. So while some people will speak about the fact that there is, that we it's part of the duties of a citizen, we also need to address the fact that the current generation of young people ages 18 to 25 are growing up in a time of complete failure of the social contract, where they are actually saddled with student debt, they are facing a climate crisis. This is the most diverse generation, racially diverse generation in U.S. history, and they face a, a, a society in which their rights and identities are not equally valued and held safe and treasured. So in this context, what is the social obligation of the government to its citizens? And if it is failing those obligations, does it have a right to conscript our bodies to be their endless cannon fodder credit card? Now, these are the, these are the arguments that I hear young people making as I've been speaking with them about the issue of expanding the draft to women. Make no mistake, as Edward said, young people will object to this. Young women will especially object to this expansion of the draft because no one likes the draft. That is historically proven over and over and over again. We object to the idea that our bodies are not ours to determine the course and the fate of. And this is particularly keenly felt by women and by feminists who have a long history of this issue being, um, of, of our be bodies being not accorded equal rights and not being uh, accorded a sovereignty and an autonomy equal to that enjoyed by certain men within our society. So when we look at the military draft, we have to think also that in no way can war be construed as feminists? And equal participation in wrongdoing does not make it right. I'm gonna repeat that. Equal participation in wrongdoing does not make it right. We do not say that slavery, which is another form of involuntary conscription, was made more just by enslaving indigenous people as well as Africans. Likewise, the military draft is not made more just by conscripting women's bodies as well as men's. The way to make uh, this injustice right is to abolish the draft for people of all genders. Another issue I would like to make from the feminist front <laughs> is that there is such a thing as feminist foreign policy. There is such a thing as a feminist approach to handling conflict. And we must remember that the military is actually simply one mode and methodology of dealing with conflict. One might argue a terrible way of dealing with our conflicts. So feminist foreign policy by and large advances peace, nonviolence, diplomacy, and indeed global justice. These 
forms of conflict resolution are not held on an equal footing in our country as uh, the use of the military as a foreign policy, um, we could say tool, but I think Edward called it a weapon and that is probably the most accurate descriptor. So if you want to advance gender equality and you want to advance feminism, you don't do it by drafting women. You do it by advancing the, the types of conflict resolution that women are advocating, that are rooted in feminism. And lastly, I just want to make the, a couple more points. One is that you, I really want to reiterate that young women strongly oppose uh, being drafted into the military. Uh, they also equally, and because Edward brought this up, uh, oppose the idea of being conscripted into any kind of national service. It is very quickly seen as ageist and inappropriate that young people would be required to serve when other people are not. Um, again, this, it, the issue hinges around involuntary conscription into doing anything. If you look at voluntary um, programs that are rooted in living wages, and in work that does not deny the dignity and humanity and the well being of any human being, you find overwhelming popular support among young people and indeed older people. This takes the form of things like a jobs guarantee, increasing the wages of AmeriCorps, VistaCorps, Peace Corps, right? Um, the idea of a Green New Deal, which is phenomenally popular, popular among young people. It is not that young people don't want to work. It is not that they don't want to serve. It's not that they don't want to help their communities and indeed the world be a better place. It's that they rightly understand that the U.S. military is not the place to do this. Young people are also very, very clear on the point of the poverty draft. And when we talk about the U.S. military draft, we also want to talk about the, the ways that poverty limits and narrows the choices of young people in the world unjustly and disproportionately according to their wealth and their economic advantages to the point where young people who do not have economic resources are drafted by poverty into joining the supposedly all volunteer military. Young people are very clear and articulate that the way to address this is not to expand the draft to everyone. The, it is to expand equal access to affordable education and equal access to well-paying jobs. That is the correct and appropriate way to end the injustice of a poverty draft. So I, I'm just gonna conclude by saying we need to be very clear that we do not want to fall into the false paradigm set up by empowered people in our society um, that say that the only way to advance feminism is by equally conscripting people, or that say that uh, the only people who do not want to see military conscription expanded to women are sexist, because actually there is a robust field of us who say that Feminism means abolishing the draft for all genders. Feminism means not relying on the military for our foreign policy conflict resolution styles. Feminism means making sure that all people in this country are held precious to, their, to this country, that they have equal access to affordable college education, equal access to living wages and decent jobs. This is what feminists looks like in the 21st century. And we need to end and abolish the military draft for all genders as part of this platform. And we need to be allies in this to young people who are remarkably clear about these points. So thank you very much. I will conclude there. Thank you very much, Rivera. Um, our last speaker is Larry Wilkerson, who has become a friend in the last, I don't know, decade when we met Larry, but uh, you've probably seen him on MSNBC and CNN. And because of his unique background, he's a retired colonel from the US Army. He was Colin Powell's chief of staff at the State Department. And he's been one of the most articulate people in the mass media on the 
uh, kinds of wars that are being fought and the consequences of them. Larry. Uh, you're, you're muted. I said, thanks, John, for putting this on uh, and start my clock so I won't go over time here. Um, I'd like to come at this from the perspective of a realist. And I don't mean a realist like my good friend at Chicago, John Mearsheimer, who sometimes lets his own theory get him trapped, as in his recent uh, conversation with me where he said that there will be a war with China and the United States will be the other antagonist. While all the indicators of a realist theory are leaning in that direction, far more powerfully, as a matter of fact, than I'm inclined to like, certainly, um, I don't think it's inevitable. And so I back out of the theory when it becomes self-entrapping. In, in, in and in this case, I, I want to say that my perspective on this is the registration system, the selective service registration system, or whatever might replace it, were we to do away with, I would say we'd still need something. And I come at this from the point of view of a realist, because just like you can't disinvent wars or the rumors of wars, and you won't be able in my lifetime or my children's lifetime to do so, just like you can't eliminate disease and you can't eliminate poverty and probably never will be able to, regardless of all of our ardent desires to do so and all the money we've spent trying to do so, um, you, you need something in the background for what I would call as a military officer, mobilization. And I'd go even further and more, be more precise and say full mobilization. And that's not to fight wars in Afghanistan. It's not to fight wars in Syria or Libya, like all of our presidents for, for the last 20 years plus have been doing. And by the way, the most egregious war with no reason was not the war in Vietnam, it's the war in Mexico. Unless you consider a valid reason, the expansion of slavery and territorial aggrandizement. As General Grant said, that was the worst war the United States to that point had ever been involved in. And most Americans don't know that that war was the highest casualty war in American history. Uh, it took more units and percentages of units than any other war we've ever fought in. It was a terrible war. So those kinds of wars should be out of the question. Well, the question then becomes, how do you prevent that? And at the same time, maintain a status where you can defend yourself if the rest of the world, in this realist theory I'm expostulating, doesn't agree with you and decide someday that it wants to take you on in a military sense. Not for a moment do I think that China would take us on by invading our shores. It would be much more insidious than that, as would Russia's. Um, and it would probably be as much our fault as it was theirs. But the possibility in my theory of realism is still there. So I want a capability to mobilize the country. And I'm worried that the Congress in this process is going to eliminate the selective service system and not put anything in its place. I don't care whether it works or not now. I don't give a rat's rear end whether it works now or not. I give a damn whether it works when it needs to work. And of course, that's pretty much the way it had to be done every time we did it in a massive way as in 1939 and 40. So that's what I'm after, and that's what I think we should keep warm and on the stove back, if you will, but necessarily there. And I see the most profound crisis confronting this country and the world, perhaps the human race. Indeed, as I work on the Climate Secur and Security Working Group here in Washington, which is incidentally mostly Department of Homeland Security and Department of Defense, the only two bureaucratic agencies really seized of this crisis at the moment, and of course I'm referring to the climate crisis, I see the need for mobilization. And again, I don't give a hang, and I'm working with a number of professors across the country from Stanford to Dartmouth on this right now, how we compose what we're calling a climate crisis core, much like the one FDR put together prior to World War II called the Civilian Conservation Corps. I don't care whether it's first in mufti or partially in uniform, or exclusively in uniform, or exclusively in mufti, it will sooner or later have to take on military aspects and military organization, and most importantly of all, 
military mobilization capability and logistics capability. And I think it's going to take 12 and a half, 13, maybe 15 million men and women. And we'll satisfy some of the business about age because I'm not exempting anybody from this core. Anybody who is mentally and physically capable of doing some of the work in this core is going to have to do it. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about flood control. I'm talking about, I'm talking about construction. I'm talking about engineering. I'm talking about firefighting. I'm talking about relocating whole cities from coastal regions. All manner of things that we now know, and we know pretty, pretty in detail at present, what we're going to be doing by 2040, 2050, certainly by 2060. It also includes refugee control, I'll call it, refugee law and lawyers who are proficient in that, running refugee camps so they're not like concentration camps as we're doing now, and preventing what we saw in our war gaming about 2060 and 2065, which is so many people coming across our southern borders that we man them with machine guns and start shooting people. When I say we, it's not just the United States. It's all the peer powers, as we call them in the simulations. And by the way, the Germans and the French and the Indians and the Chinese participated in these simulations. There are 500 million refugees in the world in 2050. And we simply can't handle them in refugee camps. So we start manning the borders with military forces and shooting these people and daring them to come across when all they want is water and food and some prospect of a future. That's where we're going to have to mobilize the country. And again, as I said, I don't care whether we put them in a uniform or we put them in mufti, a uniform would be better. Um, but we're going to have to do that. And we're going to have to call it something like the Climate Crisis Corps. And we're going to have to internationalize it eventually. I was headed for Madrid next month to talk with a group about doing just that. But because of the COVID, we had to postpone it. We'll do it in March of 2022. And we'll work virtually until that time. That's why I don't want to lose the capability, even the nascent capability, even an efficient nascent capability that can be made efficient, largely probably by military officers at the time it's necessary in order to mobilize the nation and to do the kinds of things that we are going to have to do, not only for ourselves, and many Americans don't understand that. They think we might be doing it for Myanmar or we might be doing it for Bangladesh, or we might be doing it for Iraq, where the temperatures, for example, 21 days in a row were over 126 degrees around Basra and Najaf. Um, you can't live in those kinds of temperatures. So we're going to have to deal with this. We're going to have to meet this challenge, and we're going to have to do it domestically and internationally. And we're going to need a mobilization capability to do that. So I see we need to keep that mobilization capability alive. That's the realist in me. That's the realist enemy, not constrained by theory, but looking straight into the eyes of the reality of climate change. Thank you. Thanks very much, Larry. Um, again, if, if you have questions to the speakers, you can put them on the chat. Um, and in a few minutes, I'll open, open that up. I'm also uh, about to launch a poll. Uh, we did get some feedback in the registration of the, when we had 71 registrants, 28 were in favor of abolition of selective service, 21 were in favor of universal national service. So uh, we'll see whether we get a, a different feel now when we're we're actually doing a, a poll of the people who are on the discussion and I'll leave that up and later on we'll show the results. Um, so we're gonna have some discussion now just among the speakers and then bring people into it. If you do wanna be recognized, use the uh, hand raise in the reactions. Uh, if you have an older version of Zoom, you may not have reactions. You can send uh, me a, a chat and I can try and recognize you that way. But uh, it will also shift over. I don't know whether you're seeing just the speaker, uh, which is the way I have it set up right now, uh, but we will go into the full gallery um, for the, the discussion. But um, before we go into the, 
the discussion among the speakers. Ed, I wonder if you could give an update of exactly where things stand legislatively. Somebody had already asked that in the chat, and I think that would help to set a context of the real world in which this conversation is taking place. Yes. Um, the, the, the legislative proposals uh, related to the Selective Service have been bundled into the annual National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA. This is a must-pass bill. So, you know, while there will be a few of the least militarist members of Congress who will vote against it, but probably only a handful, um, it, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that whatever gets included in the NDAA will be enacted into law. At this point, the full House of Representatives has approved a version of the NDAA that includes expansion of registration uh, for the draft or the obligation to register for the draft or more precisely presidential authority to order uh, registration for the draft to include both uh, men and women. And a similar provision is included in the version that's passed out of the Senate Armed Services Committee and will be going to the floor in the Senate um, sometime in October. At, in neither the House nor the Senate was there even debate or a vote even in committee on the question of whether selective service should be continued. Um, the only debate was whether um, it should be continued in its present form or expanded to women, um, a completely a false framing, which sort of uh, made the outcome a foregone conclusion. Um, so with that said, there will probably be some attempt in the Senate by pro-draft sexists to um, get that language kicked out of the Senate version. Uh, I think that's unlikely to succeed. Um, and so the likelihood is that this will be both in the House and Senate versions, and it will go through and be enacted into, into law. Um, that would give uh, President Biden, the authority to issue a proclamation probably a year later. So at the end of 2022, or early 2023, uh, the proclamation will be issued, uh, expanding the obligation to register to women and men. My guess is that they'll want to avoid what happened in 1980, where they had mass registration that provided a showcase for the resistance and an organizing opportunity. They'll probably just phase this in with women born after some cutoff date. My guess is it'll be a date in 2005. So sometime, let's just I think most likely start date would be probably like July 1, 2023, as they turn 18, uh, women born in 2005 will start being obligated to register. So that's where things stand in the timeline looking ahead. Realistically, at this point, this is a done deal in Congress. It's out of the hands of Congress and good because it's back in the hands of the people where the power has been handed to young women. And I am completely confident of how they will wield that power uh, to prevent actually a draft. The only question is whether they can, we can help them force Congress and the public to admit that that registration attempt has failed as it had for men. And that um, contrary to Larry's preposterous, I have to say, claims to be a realist, proposing any sort of draft is today an unrealistic option. This is a post-Vietnam generation. People won't go and you can't make them like it or not. Hey, John, can you unmute? Sorry. There you go. All right, thanks. Uh, are there still compulsions when our sons, for instance, reach the age of registration if they wanted to get college loans and a variety of other necessary steps they had to register? Uh, is that still the case? If I can take that on too quickly, somewhat surprisingly, the requirement to register in order to get federal student aid was repealed last year. Um, and what seems to have been a development didn't come from the anti-war movement. It probably came from immigration rights activists who saw um, immigrants who didn't even know they were supposed to register being denied access to higher education. So that's been off, been repealed. The main enforcement mechanism at this point is that in the majority of states, although by no means all, California is the most notable exception, although also Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Massachusetts. But in the majority of states, you have to register for selective service if you're a man and in order to get a driver's license, strangely enough. And so most people, if they register at all, it's only because it was 
implicit in getting a driver's license. The very interesting thing that was anticipated by the National Commission that studied this in their internal debates, but not acknowledged in their public report, is that most of those state laws are gendered. They say that any man subject to the registration requirement must register in order to get a driver's license. So what we're going to see following the federal action is in order to get this enforced, they're going to have to go back to state legislatures and try to get them to amend their state laws. And many of the same states that were most pro-war and pro-draft and willing to use their driver's license laws to force men to register are the same ones that a sexist will be reluctant to use their driver's license laws to force women to register. So one of the next rounds of legislative debate will be a whole slew of state by state legislative debates, which the National Commission anticipated. Um, and at the same time, there will be litigation state by state to challenge the gendered laws that say that only men lose their driver's license if they don't register when the registration requirement now applies to most men, to both men and women. So really, um, I think there's going to be very interesting state by state debates about those continued penalties. But the National Commission and Selective Service all recognize that any compliance, such compliance as they get at all at this point is almost entirely dependent on those state driver's license laws. So it comes down to the question of what state legislators will do about updating those state laws. Right. And just quickly, is there a percentage of males in the age group that registered versus didn't register? Is there any kind of working number for there what exists right now? Not really. The Selective Service claims that 90 some percent of people eventually register at some address. But the, the, the relevant metric is if you sent out an induction notice, do you have a current address where you could get provable delivery that would support prosecution if the person doesn't report for induction? Mm -hmm. Compliance is near zero with the address update requirement. Most people move long before they turn 26. The last audit of the actual registration database was in 1982. Only two years have been started up. And it already found that the address changes were rendering um, most of the records in the database useless for an actual uh, uh, draft. And okay, this was a thanks. major reason why former Selective Service Director Bernie Rosker in his testimony to the National Commission said that the uh, present records would be, in his words, quote, less than useless for okay. an actual Great. draft. Thank you. Larry, can I turn to you a minute and ask, uh, is your premise uh, for this National Conservation Corps that there is a required registration and a national uh, system that mobilizes people to participate in it? Of course there would be, um, even in a nascent rather system in complete disrepute, you'd have to put it in some working order before you could do it. And the anticipation in having to do that is even with Bernie, uh, who was a member of our all volunteer force forum and sometimes makes some really preposterous statements, even though he was a director of the selective service system about selective service, even Bernie would admit that. Um, and just look at voting, if you will, which I have spent some 14, 15 months looking rather strenuously at as a member of two different groups, TIP and also the task force on national election crises. You can do it. We did it with voting, you can do it with the draft. Okay, let me throw a different level of the argument in before we turn to people who are on the, are in the Zoom. Um, often people, my brother who was a Vietnam veteran, um, but generally in the culture, uh, there is a saying that in the, experience of being drafted and experience of going into the military, people have discovered in human terms uh, a much different America than they had known in their youth. And that also argues for the age relevance of this, that to what extent does national service of some kind, is it important for overcoming what is obvious to us every day of a, a growing rupture in American society where you have people screaming at school boards um, because they dare to require masks for kids in school. And I don't know if that's happened where you live, but 
they've been demonstrating in front of our local hospital um, opposed to requirements for health workers being vaccinated. I mean, there's some deep ruptures in American society at this point, and the question is whether some kind of national integration is needed and whether some kind of common service that is does bring people into experiences that go beyond their upbringing and their home, uh, whether that's a beneficial national goal. Anybody have some thoughts on that? I'll say as a historian here that it's complicated. <laughs> that's our standard response to pretty much everything. But I think if you look at history, you'll find that both ends of that answer are true, right? That you have clear examples of some people who have gone through and experienced, whether it's war or the CCC in the 30s or whatever it is, and they've come to know people outside of their culture, outside of their social class, their race, their gender, whatever, and have come away from that and said, I have a broader understanding of the world. And at the same time, people who have gone through that same experience have also come away with it more firmly entrenched in their beliefs than ever before, right? And so I, I would say as a historian that you can't say one or the other will happen. Um, if you're looking to the past, both have happened, right? You've had a positive experience come out of that in, in, in a way that, you know, you know, sort of Henry V, right? Like we all, we're all brothers now um, to use very gendered language, I will admit. Um, but you also have the other experience, right? Where people come away thinking, you know, I'm, I'm more firmly believe in white supremacy, for example, in World War I and World War II, you see both ends of that. So it, it's complicated. Yeah, yeah. You also I would also point out that in order to, to, to force people into that um, shared so-called experience, you need a mechanism of coercion. And coercion is a remarkably poor way to win hearts and minds. The shared experience of political imprisonment has been crucial for resistance movements and oppositional movements in countries around the world. Um, the shared communities of draft resistors in prison have formed lifelong bonds for many of them that continue today. Um, but I don't know anybody who's been locked up for opposing war, who's been persuaded by that um, to believe more firmly in the in the values of the state that put them in prison. Anybody else on that question or before we go into the conversation? Um, John, I'll just say that uh, uh, some of the most fevered and fervent conversations that Colin Powell and I used to have were over the history of the socialization of the military and how it led the way in a number of cases, reluctantly to be sure amongst many of its leaders, but nonetheless led the way in things like Harry Truman signing the, signing the executive order, which took years and years to implement, mostly because of foot dragging by military leadership on uh, integration. Um, and, and Colin had some good points that the military has done some good things. I think I've heard a lot of conversation here I've heard an overwhelming amount of conversation here about problems we're having with our democracy, with maintaining our republic. And the military has certainly in the last 20 years contributed to that, no question about it. And that's why I can't stand the all volunteer force. Uh, it's an abomination uh, for all manner of reasons I could go into for the next 30 minutes, but you don't have that time. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, the historian is correct here. It's, it's, a mixed, it's a mixed view, a mixed picture. But there's no question that in my experience, 31 years in the Army, there was a lot of socialization that went on that uh, was really remarkable to watch. You mix people that you would never mix otherwise. You mix people who would never mix otherwise. And you show them there's a different world. You show them there's a different way to get along. Uh, just look at the mess halls, for example, which now we've done away with. By the way, your tooth to tail was right a few years ago. It's not so right today because contractors are now the tail. Hundreds of thousands of contractors making $125,000 a year minimum when the troop they're replacing was making $30,000 uh, are the tail. Uh, but you, you used to have mess halls and you would see whites here, blacks here, Hispanics here. And then all of a sudden, one day you would see them begin to mingle. 
and you would understand the socialization aspect of the military, but it's not all positive. That's, that's to be sure. I, 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 I can't let that go without pointing out the flip side of that. Okay, but let quickly add, because I want to get other people into the conversation. The formal official racial segregation of the federal prisons was ended by nonviolent direct action of draft resistors, black and white, who insisted on sitting at the same tables together in violation of the then federal prison rules during World War II. Um, so it works both ways. John Garrity, can you unmute yourself? I, I've been, there yes. you go. Okay. Go ahead, introduce yourself briefly and throw your piece into it well, on I, I, national I, service. Well, um, I'm, I'm overpowered by all the speakers. Um, I, my, my study and everything of this is, is way below and my activism is way below. I, I guess what I would say about I'm, I'm 74. Um, I was educated Catholic in a year in Catholic seminary. And in 1966, I left Catholic seminary and became immediately draftable. Um, I came from veterans from the Civil War through through my dad in World War II. My uncle was B-24 pilot, assistant squadron commander killed in World War II. And a, a fellow cousin was in the Navy up the Saigon River in a, in a flatboat. And another cousin was a CO who served outside the military as CO. And my brother was threatened with prison as a CO because he wouldn't register for the draft, but he was too far gone mentally by the time they convicted him. So they just let him go and didn't make him do anything. And he died in the streets 20 years later. So I'm all over the place as a Vietnam veteran that chose to enlist to do something medical in the army instead of probably with no education at 19, potentially be in the infantry. I don't feel that my country under any circumstance has the right to ask me to bear arms where I would kill another person. I simply, it's, it's simply, I realize that they do and they, they do have that ability and law and everything else. I think it is immoral. Um, I also have a, a Protestant seminary degree in Berkeley, a master's in religion, society and ethics. So I'm kind of all over the place. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I was an E6 when I got out. I have a bronze star in an RCOM. I was in a forward infantry camp, MASH-like medical company. The other forward camp had MASH. There were mass casualties continuously. My months there in early 69, uh, two of our medics were killed in the company area when we were partially overrun. And, and it was mass incoming medevac. And I was a litter bearer more than my psych tech where I was supposed to talk to soldiers freaking out and see if I could talk company commanders and first sergeants into helping them. So I'm all over the place in my experience and I've spent 50 years being anti-war and in general pro public service for all, a la John Kennedy. So uh, that, that we all owe something back for the country we're in. The problem with that is that what's owed back can so easily be manipulated by the powerful and the powerless. But the problem I see in everything I'm hearing here is with the draft and all of it is the power resides in one set of people and the draft is against another set of people. And so how could you structure national military service or draft or selective service for both men and women? How could you structure it so there was power that resided in the young people like that they could refuse to do uniform military service, but be willing to do Peace Corps and other kinds of things. What can you give them and build into it where there's any kind of a guarantee? I think people should give back to their country, but poor people giving back is at a cost much greater to them than rich people giving back or well-educated or poorly educated and whatever. So it, it just seems that no matter what side anyone takes here, and I think everyone is so well-spoken and helps me so much to understand the issues better. How, how do you, as a 19-year-old, how did somebody give me power? So unlike my brother who was hounded by the FBI and they, they would come and try and get my mom to talk to my brother to get him to register and kept threatening him and then finally convicted him. How does my brother have that right? Would he have had that right to say, I will not kill for my country, I will not be uniformed for my country in something where some of the people go and kill others. How, how do you do that? Pacifism and conscience objection has never been respected. 
I think of Kennedy saying, when COs are respected as much as the military, then we'll finally have a mature country. Well, I agree with him and we never have gotten there. So that's my first thought. So at the end of the day, you favor national service or you don't favor national service? Realistically, in the world we, we have, I mean, the realist, uh, uh, is it Larry? The, the realist there has got a good point and especially about climate. I mean, it's interesting to move it from military to climate, but the need for military or structure. I, I'm not anti-military. I'm I'm pro the need for military in a defensive way and in a National Guard helping with floods and everything else, which our climate crisis is going to be that blown up like a nuclear war. So I, I do lean toward everyone knows something back, but how do you structure that in a fair way by the rewards you give people for service for two years, uh, education or whatever, and by not excluding anyone, but still the people in power making the decisions tend to not have any skin in the game. The people that get killed tend to be the young people and the people making the decisions of what's going to happen if you have this service. There, it's, it's, a, it's an imbalance of power. So I'm, okay. not, I'm not sure. You, you've made it far more complex. All of you have made it far more complex. I've always said national service for anyone, no one excluded, and a choice that can't be controlled by the military or the government of where I would go in relation to that national service. I, I like that phraseology. Doug Hostetter, who's a member of Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee uh, and has a different kind of experience in Vietnam. Doug. Well, I was a uh, conscientious objector and uh, chose to do my uh, alternative service with the Mennonites uh, in Vietnam, in the middle of the war zone, in the middle of a war. Uh, and for me, it was an incredibly powerful experience. Um, uh, the work that I was doing actually was, was uh, organizing Vietnamese high school students as teachers, volunteer teachers, to teach children whose schools had been destroyed by the US military. And partly because education was valued by people on both sides and because we were very careful to not allow our education to be politicized by either side. Um, I was able to kind of live at peace in the middle of a war zone um, where when the National Liberation Front would take over Tamki, uh, they would hit the, uh, uh, the Vietnamese 6th Regiment, the CIA, the USAID compound, uh, uh, but always seemed to uh, not bother me at all. Um, so, and I, I came away with a, um, you know, lifelong friends, uh, Vietnamese who actually supported both sides and uh, was able to return to Vietnam 40 years afterwards, 45 years afterwards, and discovered that uh, the kids that I uh, had taught and the high school students who had been the teachers um, were still valued. The work that I had done were friends and were glad to welcome me back and also informed me that some of the people who I just thought of as friends actually were very well connected on the other side, helping to protect me while I was there that I had no idea about. So in, in one way, uh, if, if uh, a national service or a, a kind of service where you are able to do things that are productive and helpful to humanity, I think is incredibly important. Um, for me, uh, growing up in a small Mennonite community in, in Virginia, uh, the chance to get outside of a Mennonite community, to uh, experience another culture, to be able to look at my own culture uh, from its effect on a third world country. All of those things helped make me a, a much broader and, and better educated person. I, I like Larry's idea of, of uh, Climate Change Corps. Uh, I would hope that it would not be tied to the military because I think 
Um, like the Peace Corps, uh, if, if our goal is really to make a better world and better humanity, I think that needs to be separated from a military service that is oriented around using the power of guns and bombs and force to change the world. I think we need to have a different model um, using volunteers and organizing people is fabulous. And I think Mennonites and Quakers have done that well in, in many areas around the world. And maybe maybe that kind of core should be led by, uh, by um, Mennonites and Quakers who have been doing service projects um, both at home and abroad uh, for many decades. Rivera, Can we jump in there? Yeah. yeah and, let, and let me pose a question to you, too. I mean, there's an underlying theme in what you were saying earlier about non compulsion. I mean, do you think that there is at any time a legitimacy of a society to compel uh, its population in terms of contributions that it makes to what the society deems is important? I think that's a, a, a perilous path. It's extremely dubious. Um, I haven't seen an example yet where we would have a, a legitimate need for protection of the populace, relief measures where the people themselves are not already responding in some way. Uh, we've been talking a lot about mobilization of the populace and what if we need that in this pragmatic, practical sense. We already have a deep crisis and a need for that. And what we see in the movements of people, including the young people who are the most active generation in U.S. history, that includes Vietnam generation, by the way, is that people are responding to the needs of their communities. Um, to use a couple examples, the George Floyd protests were the largest demonstrations in U.S. history. 20 million people participated in those protests. There, Larry, is your, your mobilized U.S. populace. The problem that we're seeing there is that the state does not agree with the demands and the crises identified by the people, particularly by the young people. But if we look even at the climate crisis or a crisis like the pandemic, Within two months of the pandemic started, we had 400 mutual aid networks mobilizing millions of dollars of relief in class solidarity across the country, including young people in colleges who were having to move out of their college experience. We also see um, massive mobilization for defense of the country, humanity, and the planet in the climate justice movements. Right now, we have an intense mobilization happening in Minnesota to stop the Line 3 pipeline. We don't need to be drafted into the U.S. Uh, federal government to, to, to defend our, our our communities. We need the US federal government to get itself and its act together and join the defense of the people of our water, our land, our air, and the future of the, the young generations. I think we need to remember that we are talking about service while overlooking the intense service that young people in their communities are doing every single day to hold together their families against the oppressions that are brought about by an unjust economic system and by a government that is failing regularly and consistently to do anything to alleviate and to stop and end the injustices that have already been identified by the populace as being oppressive to them. So uh, thank you for listening to my rant there for a little bit, but I just, I have a lot more hope and faith in people. I see them responding to crises all the time and being unacknowledged for the work that they're already doing. Mm -hmm. David, did you want to say something? Or oh, Grace, I'll let Grace, look, go ahead. David, I saw you clapping. I didn't know if you wanted to say something, but Grace, you have to unmute yourself and then you can. Okay, uh, still, still not getting it. Huh. Well, um, I don't know why.
Okay, maybe we'll just go on and see if there's somebody else that wants to to speak and and keep trying to unmute yourself. Great, <laughs> maybe you can do it. Is there anyone? Uh, we're getting close to the end of our allotted time. Um, Kara had to go off because she's got a meeting with her kids' teachers, which uh, is a, an urgency that imposes itself on us at certain points in our lives um, that's not to be trifled with. Uh, there you go, Grace. On. You, yeah. You're on. <laughs> okay. okay, well, I'm Grace Mishler, and I was with the Church of the Brother and Volunteer Service in Vietnam uh, from 20. 2000 to 2019, uh, with some gaps in the United States, but uh, always attention with Vietnam, uh, post-war uh, follow-up. Um, and part of me, I we had brethren volunteer services in the war uh, in, in Vietnam uh, before 1975. And um, I, I, I'm a true believer in alternative service and that's not just for the young people, but for the old people, because I was 50 years old when I went. And I just think there needs to be a sort of a structure. Yes, I know that the, much of the burden goes on with the churches uh, to do these, uh, uh, sending the people there. But I also think there should be, you know, I know we have like the Peace Corps, uh, which is great. And I'm just excited that Peace Corps is going to be in Vietnam. Um, now, one thing I was thinking about, and I want to say it was Larry, um, a concern about privatizing. Is there going to be, if, if privatizing military just really could get me? Um, and is there any danger of privatizing that? And then you have these contractors and all kinds of things that takes over. Um, do you understand what I'm saying? Or is it just, it's just something underneath I see could emerge is the own, the privatizing the military um, to where it doesn't really represent the people. That has essentially happened. The ultimate public function, making war, or look at prisons, putting people in prison has been privatized. Prisons to a degree, a degree I hope the Congress wakes up and begins to arrest, but the military is just privatized to the max. In Iraq, we had more contractors than we had Marines and soldiers. In Afghanistan, we had more contractors than Marines and soldiers. We have made war, an endless war, endless stupid war, so lucrative that we have an entire industry in this country aimed at its perpetuation. And they're all contractors. They're all civilians. Yeah, I'd note, I was actually surprised when they put out statistics of, of deaths in Afghanistan, that there were more deaths among contractors. 5,000. Than there were among U.S. military. Oh. Um, so, I mean, it's... It's Biden's pulling the plug on the contractors, which may have been one of the sources of intense opposition to his decision to end the U.S. war in Afghanistan. So something taxpayers should do something about, and they should yeah. have started a long time ago. There are hundreds of thousands of contracts that the military has orchestrated from the Pentagon that the military has no idea how much they cost on a weekly, monthly, annual, five-year, 10-year basis. They have no idea. They can't audit themselves. They fail every audit. The GAO produced a report last Monday accusing the Army. The Army has not even put its member on the board the GAO ordered a year ago to begin to examine these contract processes. They don't want to examine them because they're so lucrative. People are making millions off of them. I don't know whether it's fair to ask people this question. Um, I'm going to, it turns out that the poll was on for just a minute and I can't put it back up without erasing 
all the results so far. So I am gonna do that. I'm gonna relaunch the poll. Um, and if you poll, if you voted before, vote again. Um, and uh, let's see what numbers we get up with. Um, Norma, I'm gonna get, we're running a little long. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna unmute you and give you just a minute and then we will wrap up. Um, okay. The uh, World War II was funded in part by people based in the United States. They wanted Hitler to march against the uh, Bolshevik revolution. I, I already did that, okay. Uh, that was the whole thing. That the same thing as Afghanistan was uh, invaded for was to advance against the uh, Bolshevik revolution. The Af Afghanistan government had made alliances with formations of uh, uh, from I, and I support. Think you're taking us from off. The USSR. No, a it's uh, wait, wait, okay. wait, wait uh, a second. So yeah. Okay. Um, all right. I need to respect the time frame uh, for that we had set this program. I want to give each of the speakers a chance to say some final thoughts and then we will uh, go on. We'll thank everybody and we will continue this discussion, I'm afraid, still for a couple of years. So in any particular order, Ed, Bob, Larry, Rivera, would you like to? Unmute yourself and say, give a final. Well, I've got to run. Um, I'll just say, I appreciate everyone's views here. For the last decade, decade and a half, I have been, as one person called me the other day, the Quaker Colonel working with the FCNL and others of that ilk to try and stop things like endless stupid wars. I appreciate all the insights I've gained here. Um, I still maintain my position, perhaps uh, because of my professional relationship uh, with the military for so long that we need it uh, and that we shouldn't discount it, we should fix it. I'm not sure it's fixable. Uh, and in that case, maybe before I die, I'll change my mind. Um, right now, it looks close to being unfixable, uh, and that's uh, a wholly different matter, but it's a matter that should concern every American, and it doesn't. It doesn't concern them to the extent that it should, just like the wastage of money doesn't concern them. Um, trillions of dollars, enough to give every person in America a free education, enough to give Medicare enough money to handle everybody for the rest of eternity virtually. We've wasted in the military. And that is a cardinal sin. Thank you, Larry. Oh. Rivera, do you have some final thoughts? I actually 100% agree with Larry's final statement about the, the waste of resources. From a feminist agenda standpoint, we agree. <laughs> um, I just urge everyone to speak with your young people in your life about this to say that you will stand with them as an ally, to help them understand that there are multiple generations of draft resistance uh, in the room today and throughout the country, and that it is not futile. It may even be really critically important towards reigning and constraining wars, and that there's a lot of knowledge um, at their disposal for helping them with that if they would like, and that we are waiting to take their lead in, um, or to follow their lead in how they want to respond to this mandate that's coming down. Ed? Just want to remind people that um, the congressional debate and decision is not the end of this. And from the point of view of, you know, a crass argument from return on investment of your time and effort as activists who oppose more wars like the US war in Indochina, that supporting draft resistance, we've gotten so close to taking it off the table from the war planners. 
supporting the next generation of draft resistors and exposing the fact that draft registration has failed is one of the most highly leveraged ways that you can devote your energies in a way that has stopped the draft and could have significant impact. So if you're looking for ways to constrain war making and empower young people at a time when a lot of older people are despairing about either of these, this is a way forward. And I look forward to being part of that uh, with hopefully many of you. Bob, you have I guess, are you pro yeah. happy with what you have wrought? Well, it's been a good discussion. I, I just want to point out that the way that Congress is dealing with this issue is just outrageous. I mean, virtually nobody outside of the people in Congress and very few of them probably really understand the significance of, of asking all women, you know, young women to register for the draft. It's, it's actually something, you know, that is so unpopular really that they've slipped it in without any debate of any significance. And, and it's going to have, you know, an impact of further militarizing our society. And I think that the other point to be made is that it's just so, uh, so ironic or maybe appropriate that this is being slipped into the, uh, the same bill that Congress is going to uh, actually put in more money for the military than in, the Biden administration asked for. I mean, this is just, you know, it's just crazy how uh, how dysfunctional it all is. It's just so far removed from from what the public wants. It's just, you know, it's got to stop. But it's, but I think Ed's right. It's going to have to stop by resistance, not by putting any hope in Congress. Well, I want to thank everybody. Um... I think this, especially what Bob just said about the, in a sense, the scandal of the lack of attention from the media for what is a profound, you can either see a change or an affirmation, but it's, it's uh, changing something in the way. And ironically, if Ed is right about the resistance to it, it may be that the inclusion of women is a good thing in the sense that people are actually gonna notice and that there's going to be now a fight all over the country about this issue um, that as we've seen uh, nationally confuses the lines. Um, and in that confusion, there may be opportunities to actually have communication and, and some victories. So uh, thank you again, everybody. Um, and uh, we will continue. Uh, we haven't set the fall program yet. We know that VPCC is going to do uh, several programs on music in the anti-war movement um, with people who performed it um, and people talking about it. So uh, you'll, you're on our lists until you take yourselves off them now. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you especially for, for all of the speakers. Uh, two of them we've now lost because of pressures on running over time uh, and other things in their lives, but uh, we will let them know privately. Um, so you, and as I say, you will get a note from me uh, with a, uh, the link to be able to watch this and share it with people who couldn't be here. Uh, and if anybody is in the position to provide financial support to this effort, um, if you go to, uh, well, I'll send out the link when I send out the follow-up notice, but, or if you go to the website, um, vietnampeace.org, um, you'll see the link there, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the creators of Zoom did not make an exception for not-for-profits in their charges, and uh, so we have to pay those charges as well as uh, all of the other 
things that just allow us to keep doing what we're doing. So thank you again uh, and have a, we're in the beginning of the week, have a good week. <laughs> Let's hope that Biden gets his budgets through this week. It will make a big difference for all of us. Bye-bye.